Okay, welcome everybody for this uh, last afternoon session. Afternoon for us, for Martin, it's uh, pretty early in the morning. So uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Martin Lassour from Harvard University. And uh, I learned what BHI means, and he will be talking about the positive mass theorem with arbitrary hands. Please, Martin. Well, thank you very much. Um, so the BHI is a black hole initiative. Uh, uh, but anyway, it's it's a, a great pleasure to give this talk. Um, the speakers uh, and the talks have been uh, wonderful. I've been uh, trying to follow every everything from afar, and it's um, worked very well. So it's a it's a great privilege, and I'm very very happy to be here. And I thank the organizers very much for for inviting. Okay, so um, I would just like to start with some uh, inspiration from none other than um, Misha Gromov, where uh, uh, excuse me, my, uh, my headphones did something strange there. Uh, so um, yeah, I would just like to start with some kind of inspiring passages from uh, Misha's uh, four lectures um, that you can that you can find. So the, as he says, so the most the tantalizing aspect of scalar curvature is that it serves as a meeting point between two different branches of analysis, the index theory and the geometric measure theory. Each one of these theories has its own domain of applicability to scalar curvature with significant overlaps, etc. This suggests on the one hand a possible unification of the two theories and on the other hand a radical generalization or several such generalizations of the concept of a space with scalar curvature bounded from below. Um, so I won't be talking so much in spirit of the first passage, although I will make a couple of uh, remarks with regards to, to, to this uh, in the context of the positive mass theorem. And then he also says, uh, unlike manifolds with controlled sectional and reach he curvatures, those with scalar curvatures and from below are not configured in any specific or rigid, but display an uncertain variety of flexible shapes similar to what sees in geometric topology. Yet there are definite limits to this flexibility where determination of such limits crucially depends, at least in the known cases, on two seemingly unrelated analytic means, index theory and geometric measure theory. So um, these are these are very kind of inspiring, uh, insightful remarks. So today we'll obviously be focusing on the geometric measure theory aspect of scalar curvature. And um, we won't be talking so much about index theory, but as I will describe, the positive mass theorem has also been shown or has, has a proof originally uh, put forward by Witten, which uses um, index theory. And some of the things that I'll be talking about today has also been approached with uh, index theoretic means, um, but the results are kind of different and, and I'll emphasize that distinction. Okay, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, with the positive mass theorem. Um, at least the basic, uh, the basic sort of statement. So the idea is, you have you have manifolds that look like this. So these are the manifolds uh, of interest. So basically, outside of a compact set, right? Outside of a compact set, say outside of this region, right? then the the manifold looks like disjoint union a finite number of ends and the ends are diffeomorphic to r3 minus a ball right so that's the you change colors uh, that's this region right and the ball is is, is here uh, if you will the boundary of the ball and um there's a coordinate chart in which the metric uh, looks like that. So there's decay on the first, on the zeroth, the first and the second order derivatives of the of the metric, where this is your metric of, of interest and this is the, the flat metric. And Q is a, a specified decay rate uh, that you that you need or that you that you have as a convention of what you mean by asymptotically flat. But there are there are uh, reasons for this for this for this. Q. In other words, it can't be too small. If it's too small, if the decay is too slow, 
then uh, lots of things don't don't work out. None of the methods that we have uh, quite work. So you need some you need some kind of decay to things to make things well defined and so on. But anyway, in this context, uh, due originally to uh, physicists in the sixties. The 60s, um, oh no, wait, Tessa and Misna. You have a definition of mass, uh, which in these coordinates looks like this. So you look at uh, integrals over, if you like, a two sphere. Uh, so that's, that's this condition um, of, of these terms uh, of the metric. And you normalize it by this, uh, with this term. And um, you take the limit as rho goes to infinity. So as these spheres get larger and larger. And I'm sure you're familiar that, you know, in the in that context, there's there's a, a theorem initially due to due to Shen Yao and that has been proven in uh, increasing levels of uh, generality. But anyway, what our study does, so so what we do is is basically we don't study manifolds of the of the kind described above. But rather, uh, we will consider manifolds that look like this. So you have one good end, right? So you can think of um, this being an end, right? My rubber is too large. So you can think of this being an end, right? So so this is you know, this is the end where you have the asymptotically flat coordinates. And then um, out here, so let me let me make that a little neater. So out here, you have uh, all different kinds of structures uh, that you you don't control at all. So this could be a singular point, say uh, called point of incompleteness. So it could, it could be for incomplete manifolds. Uh, and then you could have uh, some, some other end here, but say that's some, some ends, but you don't know what they are. And you, know, you could have lots of topology, handles, etc., uh, And you just don't know anything about um, what's happening on the, on these ends, and then the question is, does the positive mass theorem hold if, uh, say, I assume, uh, so is there a positive mass theorem? Uh, for these kinds of spaces where now the mass of interest will be, uh, when you measure the mass, in this, right, in the in the end that you have, which you know is a good end. So M lives right where it can be defined. Uh, and then suppose, say you assume some restrictions on the on the scalar curvature of this of the whole space, then can you still prove that the mass is non-negative, say? Right? So that's the that's the study. That's what we'll be doing. So we won't be doing the manifolds of the first slide. We'll be doing things like this. Okay. So, what am I actually going to talk about today? So, I mean, first, I'm going to just quickly uh, run through some basic things in the study of scalar curvature that's uh, germane to this kind of analysis. Uh, then, I will talk about the modern proof of the classic positive mass theorem and describe how it fails. Uh, and and you know show how it fails to show fails for this problem, and then once we'll once we'll have done that, um, we'll talk about some new techniques initiated largely due to Gromov. Um, We'll talk about some motivation, a problem in conformal geometry, which we were initially trying to solve. Uh, and then, of course, we'll uh, talk about uh, the actual 
result of, of, of our paper with Ryan and Yao and the main ideas that go into it. Okay. So apologies for those who know so much about scalar curvature. Um, I'll try to run through this rather quickly. But uh, this slide is probably the, the least surprising to you all. So Ricci is uh, defined here and scalar curvature is a trace of Ricci. And uh, one way to think about the scalar curvature, although I believe that Gromov doesn't think that this way has led to that many theorems. I, I think he mentions this in his four lectures, but anyway, uh, this is uh, if the if the scalar curvature is not negative, then the volume of small balls uh, are smaller than the, the Euclidean. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, if there's a product, then then the scalar curvature is additive, and this is kind of a fundamental theorem uh, due to Shenyao. Uh, in 79 and then generalized somewhat by Gromov Lawson, different different proof in particular uh, in, the, in the 80s. So the idea being that uh, if this has, this admits uh, non-negative scalar curvature, then you can find the, right, the connect sum and that will also have a, a PSC as we call it or positive scalar curvature. And um, the Shenyao proof is a PDE proof. The gromov lawson is an explicit um, explicit construction. So of course, some questions in scalar curvature by no means all, consider simply which manifolds admit uh, PSC or admit uh, a metric with the scalar curvature abounded below. And also what are the geometric consequences? Right now, of course, this is what will be. This is us, right? This is today. This is us today. That's that question we'll be looking at. And we'll be doing something a bit more general than this. A bit more general than this. Okay. So already for n equals two for surfaces, you can see that having non-negative scalar curvature everywhere can only happen in the presence of certain topologies, right? So, you know, just by the Gauss-Binet formula, uh, you you can see already that you know the Euler characteristic, say, is non-negative uh, if the scalar curvature is everywhere non-negative. So already that leads to quite strong, very strong restrictions, of course. So more generally, for compact three manifolds. Um, uh, you've got Perelman's resolution of the Thurston geometry relation for three manifolds with a boundary. You can reduce it to Perelman by color to Lee and from of Lawson and in the compact spin simply connected and is larger or equal to five. You've got Gromov, Lawson, Rosenberg, Stolz. But that doesn't cover non-compact things, uh, which is what we'll be uh, looking at today. Um, and, you know, just as a, as a as a rather enticing list, Kromov lists at least over a hundred uh, problems and conjectures. Right, so um, you've got all these sorts of themes within the research of uh, curvature. You've got you've got characterization for non-compact things. So this has been contributed to by members of the audience by people in this room. So we have some experts. Um, and then uh, geometric inequalities. So this is what will be what will be focusing us. Uh, and then rigidity, uh, right? We'll talk about talk about that. And then there's there's all all sorts of other things that you can look at. So, you know, convergence stability under these kinds of bounds, um, low regularity versions of, of, of this inequality. Uh, you could think about what, uh, whether something admits affiliation by leaves, which, ha which are PSC. You can think about the moduli space of metrics with uh, PSC. So there's, there's, there's also all sorts of things. 
And finally, this is my last slide of the introductory. Um, we know that there's this kind of index theoretic approach. So this is the, the index theorem and um, from the definition of the analytic index and under some choices uh, of how you set up your Dirac operator, uh, you get the scalar curvature that shows up. And so if uh, it has a sign, uh, if it's a positive in particular, you know that the uh, analytic index is zero and therefore the topological index associated with D is zero. And that leads to all kinds of things, but, uh, and that was first how it was, uh, how, it, how it came in by Lishna Rowitz in, in, the, in, the, in the 60s. So here we're gonna do more of the, of the second, so manipulate hypersurfaces. Uh, and of course, something that's very useful is uh, the conformal formula for the change in, in the scalar curvature under uh, change of the metric, which is a conformal change. So this is the this is the formula you get for the change in the scalar curvature. Well, L of of this uh, can be read off from uh, what's called the conformal Laplacian, which involves the uh, ordinary Laplacian and the scalar curvature with this uh, with this coefficient here. But of course, there are other things that you can do, and you know. Uh, I won't be talking about either of these, uh, either of these two. So, but some people in the audience have worked on these. So. Right. So let's actually get to um, the heart of the subject. So the the theorem, the classic positive mass theorem, tells you that a complete asymptotically flat three manifold with non-negative scalar curvature um, has mass non-negative and zero if and only if G is flat. So this is the rigidity part, right? Because it tells you that this mass can only be zero in this case. Uh, and this is the non-negative part. So we today will be focusing on this. We focus on non-negative, non-negativity. And as I showed you, these are the kinds of manifolds that this theorem applies to. Now, by asymptotically flat, uh, as I showed you before, you need some decay uh, in some de derivatives, and these are weighted, uh, weighted Sobolev spaces that capture the decay. Uh, and then when you assume that the decay is sufficiently large, so I had it as Q before, but here I call it tau, uh, then you have this, this ADM mass that's well-defined and that looks like this. And an important special uh, subclass of manifolds that you'd like to study or that, that make the arguments, the geometric arguments much easier are what are called harmonically flat. So harmonically flat is simply an extra condition to asymptotically flat where the metric is conformal to the flat metric. Uh, and the conformal factor is actually harmonic with respect to the Euclidean metric, right? So that's, that's what that's saying. Um, and when you have this, as I'll describe below, you, you can somehow uh, simplify many of the arguments because this conformal, f this, the fact that the metric is conformally flat means that in a lot of the equations relating, um, say, the mean curvature or the second fundamental form of certain hypersurfaces uh, within your manifold, you can kind of relate them to hypersurfaces in the, in the flat space, in Euclidean space. And some of those relations and equations simplify when you have uh, such asymptotics. Anyway, an important theorem in that context is a, is a density theorem, as it's often called. And that tells you that actually, if you're complete asymptotically flat with non-negative scalar curvature, then for any epsilon, there exists a complete harmonically flat G tilde uh, with the same uh, restriction on scalar curvature, such that these are close uh, in the relevant sense with the scalar curvature uh, remaining close in L1. So what that's saying is that, you know, suppose I had a counterexample to the to the positive mass theorem for an asymptotically flat manifold. Well, I can always reduce it to something that's harmonically flat. So I reduce it to this. So this is a useful, uh, useful reduction. Right. And I talk about this because it will, this reduction no longer becomes possible in our case. And that's the main, that's one of the main things that, well, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that was a, that was a problem. So what's particularly nice about, so this is now I'm in the, in the part of the talk where I'm overviewing the kind of modern version of the positive mass theorem, the, 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 the kind of slick proof of the, of the positive mass theorem.
So Locamp found a way to compactify the problem using a very clever, uh, but actually ended up being rather a simple way of um, compactifying the problem. So what he shows is that um, if the scalar curvature is non-negative uh, and the harmonically flat manifold has negative mass, right? So that's what this is saying. Uh, then what you can do, so this is this is what you start with, right? This is This is your starting point. Starting point, and suppose that the mass, suppose that the mass when you measure here, so call it say m m one for this n number one. Suppose it's negative, right? Then what you can do is you can actually uh, compactify these ends by using the conformal factor as a kind of uh, way to 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 bring the the non compact ends uh, and to and to close them down. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, my uh, is, there is a there is a typo. This H should be before the K. My apologies. Um, anyway, so so you can compactify the ends that you that you uh, are not are not considering. So not where the mass is negative, and you can actually uh, show that. Um, outside of some region, the you can find a deformation of the metric so that in fact um, you have something that's flat outside a compact set in the relevant distinguished end in which you had assumed negativity. Okay, but then once you do that, um, you're in a rather good position because of course you can identify this uh, and and end up with a torus. So this is this region. Here is just the you know what you get from identifying a big the sides of a big cube in the flat in the flat region, uh, and then of course now you do that in a way. Uh, this whole process is 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 happening in a way where the scalar curvature um, ends up being positive, and now you're rather happy because of course you have produced a, a PSC metric on the connect sum of say uh, xn with the torus where i've just i've drawn xn here as another torus but it could be anything right it's just the results from the compactification of the other ends which in particular could have genus or whatever um so you now have produced a psc metric on something which is a closed manifold and which is a connect sum of a torus with a with a closed manifold and of course you know by geometric theorems that such a thing doesn't exist and that's your contradiction. So that's just uh, what I was just what I was just saying. So the, the classic theorem of Shen Yao is that such a manifold doesn't admit PSC, uh, right? It doesn't admit PSC at least from three to seven. That was already done in 19, 1979, which uh, was generalized in two thousand and seventeen. But anyway, the argument uh, I only include it because it's rather quick and it kind of shows uh, it will give us a taste of what's to come. Um, so if you have something that's orientable with PSC and n is less or equal to seven than any non-zero homology class, uh, so integer integer homology class in H n minus one is representable by a collection of compact oriented hypersurfaces, um, each of which admits uh, PSC. So what that should really say is you get a stable minimal surface. Uh, when you're minimizing the homology class, right? So this is what—that's the regularity part of the of the of the theorem, uh, and that's something that's very classical. And then um, once you have the the stability inequality, you can look at variations of the surface. So you can have some surface, and you look at some normal vector field. Uh, you vary the surface normal to this. Um, you vary you vary the surface in the in the normal direction. Uh, by some uh, phi nu, where phi is, say, the, the, the speed of the variation. Uh, and then what you get is um, the stability inequality, which, which reads like this. Uh, and then using the Gauss equation, you can rewrite some of these terms, uh, and you end up showing that um, because these are good terms in, in the way you've, uh, you've, you've assumed them, this is actually ends up being zero because it's a minimal surface in this case. You can show that um, you get a, a this inequality on on uh, sigma n minus one, right, which is your hypersurface, and that actually by looking at the conformal Laplacian, which is what I showed you a few slides ago, 
you can, you can show that this in fact admits PSC. So this is an overview of the SIG proof. You start with something general, you move to something that's uh, harmonically flat. That was the reduction, right? Uh, where you had some nice form of the metric outside a compact set in each end. Once you have this, then you do the, the low camp procedure, right? So this is what, what happens here. That produces something flat outside a compact set and you've compactified the other ends. And then you identify the sides of a big cube and end up with a torus in a way that preserves the scalar curvature positivity. And then this you can rule out by the geometric theorem I showed you above, proven by Shen Yao. So this is the uh, the classic. Um, sorry, this is this is the this is the 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 you know the classic slick version of the modern of the modern proof of the of the of the, of the classic theorem. Now I'm going to change gears a little bit here. Um, so bear with me for just a second. I'm going to change gears, and we're going to put the positive mass theorem behind us. Uh, we won't be thinking about it anymore for a list for at least a, a few slides. And I want to think about conformal geometry because that's actually how we uh, came to the problem with uh, Ryan and Yao. Um, so the classic theorem of Cooper says that uh, if Mg is simply connected and locally uniformly flat. Uh, then there's an immersion into SN, which induces the locally conformally flat structure on M by pullback. And moreover, this map is unique up to conformal geomorphisms of SN. So this naturally leads to the question of simply when is phi a diffeomorphism onto its image? And as far as we could tell, the first time that was studied in the context of scalar curvature was by Shen Yao in a beautiful Inventionist paper of 88. Um, and it was recently resolved uh, by the work of uh, Cho Dosh Li. Um, and then we gave a, a different proof, which was more in the spirit of the original ideas of Shen Yao. And that's what will motivate the, uh, the positive mass theorem with arbitrary ends, which I introduced in the first uh, first few slides, which you might have said, "Why are we interested in such a such a such a theorem?" Well, anyway, the um, the way the way to think about this one is um, you can think about the conformal Green's function. So the Green's function for the conformal Laplacian at a at a pole, uh, you know, uh, with a pole at p. So this is uh, the operator of interest. This is what I mean by the Green's function. Um, and what, what happens, which is kind of remarkable, and this was used uh, very much in Shane's resolution of the Yamabe problem. What happens is that the blow up of the Green's function can be used to your advantage to construct something that's asymptotically flat by using the Green's function itself as a conformal factor. And what that does, so remarkably, the Green's function has this property that you can use it as a conformal factor to create something asymptotically flat. And then once you've done that, you can just, you know, by, by say, um, some, some stroke of imagination you can just say well why don't i consider the mass associated with the asymptotically flat end that i've obtained by blow up using my conformal greens function so you might say that's a rather strange thing to do why should the mass obtained by blow up of the conformal greens function why should that be interesting to 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 look at and i think that's that's where this proposition for me was, was first so striking, such a beautiful result. Well, it tells you that actually, if, if MG is just some complete uh, manifold with non negative scalar curvature, and phi, say, is a conformal map from M to SN, which of course is the kind of map that we're interested in from the uh, slide I showed you before, uh, then it turns out that, that the injectivity of this map. <laughs> Is is a is an it is an if and only if with the with the positivity of the mass obtained by blowing up the um, the manifold with its conformal Green's function. So there's a there's a beautiful link here between 
the mass of the of the blow up and the um so how how do you define the energy well the the uh that's more of a typo really it should just say the mass right it's just the mass uh, so e e was the language used in the original paper so i stick to that but but e is really just the mass so you could just say m um so so then what they what they conjectured is is said okay well suppose you had some complete non-compact Riemannian manifold with non-negative scalar curvature and then you just assume that one of these ends has an asymptotically flat structure so this distinguished end has an asymptotically flat structure and then you say well is it the case that the positive mass theorem holds for such a space so if the scalar curvature of the of the whole space uh, is non-negative but these ends are arbitrary you have no idea what they're doing they, you know it could be all, all all sorts of things you just don't know um then is it still true that the mass is non-negative and if it is uh then you know that this mass is non-negative or positive and um and you get injectivity of the of the of the um of the conformal map so this is kind of how I would summarize the various contributions in the literature. It's a bit confusing. Um, so Shen Yao established the injectivity of the map using other means. They don't use it via a uh, positive mass theorem, but rather by looking more directly at the, um, at the problem. For n is greater or equal to seven, and for n is less than seven, they have some assumptions, right? From four to six, and from n equals three, they don't actually include a statement. But they show that it follows anyway from the positive mass theorem with arbitrary ends, but they don't prove the positive mass with 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 arbitrary ends. And in, in a previous uh, paper with Ryan and Yao, we showed that it actually also follows from what you could call um, the Torres conjecture or the Garosh conjecture um i think that's how should uh describe it but basically that's the conjecture that um you can't put a psc metric on the torus connect sum with x we saw that for closed x but now this is for non-compact x right so it's your arbitrary x uh so for complete non non complete non-compact manifold x uh is it the case that you can still put a psc metric on on the connect sum of this with the torus and um so so we show that that you know we show that the injectivity actually just follows from from that geometric statement and that geometric statement we prove for n equals three but we also prove between four and seven under some assumptions but those assumptions end up being preserved in the procedure so they that gives a restricted version uh of the injectivity of the uh of the map and then chodoshti actually in a beautiful paper which uh, also um, shows that you kind of have PSC metrics on closed aspherical uh, um, um, spaces, which was of course uh, generalized recently in the in the talk that um, Chow Chow was giving. Uh, but but anyway, in that first paper of theirs, um, so in that first paper, they actually show the uh, excuse me. They show um, they show this theorem without assumptions uh, between four and seven, and thus yield the first uh, full proof of of the uh, what you could call the Liouville theorem. Um, and then we uh, prove the uh, generalized version of the positive mass theorem with arbitrary ends, and so we give a kind of proof more in the spirit of uh, Shen Yao in this uh, later paper. Um, so the final result that you get, which is now a theorem. Um, the following so you have a complete manifold with non-negative curvature if you have a conformal map then uh this map is in fact uh, injected okay so that was the that was the motivation uh from uh from conformal geometry and now i'd just like to talk about some recent results uh on non-combat manifolds which will kind of herald for the the ideas of the proof and the techniques and and which will make them more uh, natural in the view of, of what's been done. So mu bubbles is a terminology. I think it comes from Gromov, I'm pretty sure, but uh, not everyone adheres to it. So I've stuck to it, but anyway, 
So there were some beautiful recent papers uh, by various people using uh, immune bubbles, not just um, Misha Gromov himself, but others too. And uh, one that uh, that was kind of quite recent uh, by Jintian Zhu. He shows that if you have uh, an orientable, complete open Riemannian manifold with non-negative scalar curvature and admits a smooth proper map to uh, the product of the torus with R then with the line. And in fact, you have this rigidity. So, um, so it's isometric to the, to the flat torus, to the, to the flat torus times R. And then of course, in uh, a wonderful, uh, contribution, Chodosh Lee and Gromov independently showed that, uh, you have this rigidity, right? So for closed aspherical manifolds, four or five manifolds for, for you know you, you can't have PSC and if you have non-negative you have Ricci flat and you can actually prove more things but anyway they they show that these kinds of bases don't have uh, PSC metrics and then more recently uh, they even have this kind of um, this more more recent statement which which kind of combines uh, I haven't studied the proof in in a lot of detail yet but it seems that they combine some previous ideas and some other ideas and metric geometry and and anyway so that's the even more kind of complete picture of what happens in those dimensions and these kinds of assumptions um so this is the other uh right this also uses uh, mu bubbles the the, so this was the this was the theorem that i was describing before the one that implies the the injectivity of the map uh, so PSC is not allowed on manifolds, which look like Shen Yao Shik cross S1 connects sum with an arbitrary manifold. So Shen Yao Shik, I'm not going to define, but basically it comes from the um, from the Shen Yao paper to a great extent um, in order to do this uh, inductive procedure where you minimize in homology classes at each step. You need the homology of the manifold to be organized in the right way. And that's precisely what Shen Yao Shik uh, means and that's a terminology due to Gromov as well, I believe. And um, basically, what they show is that so, in particular, I mean, the torus is a is a Shen Yao Shik manifold, but you've got lots of Shen Yao Shik manifolds that 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 are um, not the torus. And anyway, the point is that um, this obviously implies um, this obviously implies that the torus doesn't admit PSD, of course, which I don't even write because uh, this is obviously a lot more general. Uh, and what's beautiful, I think, uh, about this paper is that it kind of, uh, or at least, you know, this uh, application of mules and, and the stability inequality that's that's in there was really what got us. Uh, we we had been trying to prove the generalized uh, positive mass theorem for a while, but it was reading this uh, paper of Chodosh Lee that really got us um, started. Uh, anyway, so we we have a kind of similar theorem, but using minimal surfaces and that has this, that has uh, drawbacks it has some advantages but it has some drawbacks so i suppose the advantage is that we actually look at sys so uh, you know these shen yang shik connect some uh, xn without this s1 product so from that standpoint you cover a kind of wider class of manifolds but the the main drawback is that you actually have this this uh Kind of condition which tells you that lam, um, row balls, so row metric balls, are lambda lib shits contractible, right? At least for between uh, n four to seven, you we have to make this assumption to get the theorem. So it's it's not it's not uh, it doesn't prove this one without assumption uh, between four and seven. So that was the that was the drawback. But of course the you know on the positive side you sort of cover a wider class of manifolds, but Somehow, there is probably a statement out there which is which rules out this condition, but so far I haven't been able to uh, to prove that. And then, of course, I just wanted to mention some what I think are uh, quite extraordinary, beautiful results by Jian Wang, um, uh, where now it's minimal surfaces that are being used as opposed to mute bubbles, but um, Mix Yao meets your minimal surfaces as it were uh and of course this is a, a beautiful results recent results which i think 
combines lots of lots of ideas in the in the subject. Um, but anyway, so those those are some kind of results for non-compact manifolds, recent results, and um, in particular, you know, this this sort of space doesn't ad admit PSC. And so the landscape, uh, as it were, looks a little like this. You have the original PSC results of Shen Yao in 79. Uh, uh, you have the original Shen Yao PMT. So that's the positive mass theorem. Then you have low camp, which offers the compactification in 1999. Uh, oh, I should have, I should have mentioned first, you have the, uh, you have the, right 88 paper uh where they put forward the positive mass theorem with arbitrary ends that's that's a conjecture uh they prove that that means phi is objective but then in 1999 low camp reduces uh the uh pmt to the geometric statement and there's no psc metric on the torus uh or you know the torus connects some and then uh we show that actually this geometric theorem is if x is non is is just arbitrary, then uh, that implies the objectivity of the map. So that's the first paper, and then that was shown by Cho Dong Shli uh, in 2020, and then we uh, proved the kind of uh, a generalized version of the positive mass theorem with arbitrary ends, which now implies uh, which now implies the positive mass with arbitrary ends, and therefore implies the objectivity of the map, but through a different different argument than, uh, than what was just outlined. Okay, so finally, we get to the, the main subject. I think I have about 20 minutes left, more or less. Um, so that should give us ample time to actually get on with, uh, with the, the results and, and you know, some of the ideas. So as I'm sure you've seen, and some of you know very well, um, mu bubble you're not minimizing uh, area anymore like you were doing in the Shenya 79 proof, but you're minimizing uh, the kind of weighted area minus weighted volume over some, some open set of, of, of interest that you end up selecting and choosing based on you know, topological assumptions that you make on your, on your space. And I think one of the great things about mu bubbles or the reason why they're kind of so interesting is because they allow you to handle regions that would otherwise pause, uh, pose, excuse me, problems when you, when you minimize. So in particular, suppose you had an end like this, right? And this was really shrinking down to infinity and you had some, you had some cycle here and you minimize in the homology class of this cycle then the issue is that your minimizer runs uh, runs down the tunnel, as it were, and disappears uh, in the limit, right? And of course, remember that minimizing was the, the key idea behind the Shenya proof. You minimize because then you obtain something that's, that's regular, that's embedded, and that has the stability and equality that's satisfied by the, virtue, by the virtue of being a minimizer. And then once you have that, you can play around with the stability and equality and prove various things about the hypersurface. So if your minimizer is disappearing because you have some non-compact end, then you know the whole proof just stops working from you know day one. And the wonderful idea uh, to handle these kind of ends, but this could also be true of, of a boundary, say, is that you construct a, a function h, which will go to negative infinity or positive infinity, uh, and and that will contain, as it were the the regions of interest so suppose you had a manifold of this kind if h is h is going down to negative infinity or positive infinity here what that really does when you look at this functional that's going to contain uh, all your minimizers to live within this region and if they live within this region and you can prove you know regularity and existence of a minimizer etc uh, then you will have something embedded and you will have something um, that obeys some stability inequality. Now, this, this trick seems almost too simple. I mean, it, it literally is saying, well, okay, you want to contain yourself within a region of interest, so why don't I just put H is going to infinity and have a volume term that will repel any surfaces from ever getting close, right? So if there's a surface that's, that's you know, going to be close here, uh, then it's going to be 
penalized by the functional, by the choice of H, right? So it seems like such a simple thing to do, and it seems like that shouldn't be allowed to work. Magically, uh, choosing H well enough uh, leads to a stability inequality that's powerful enough to prove theorems. And I think that's the main, that's the main uh, point to take away, I guess. So yeah, on the general use of mu bubbles, so I mean, you've got to prove existence and regularity of minimizers, uh, but that's not so, not so hard in view of the geometric uh, measure theory that's already available. Um, the first variation leads to uh, a mean curvature that looks like this, so you have a prescribed mean curvature equation. Um, the second variation looks like this, uh, so that's a little, little more complicated to, to handle, but if u is just equal to one, then this goes, um, this term disappears, uh, this term and this term disappear. And so you see that the relevant terms become uh, this, uh, this whole term here and the scalar curvature. And so it turns out, because uh, all, of, all of these other terms uh, appear with a, with a sign, so it turns out that um, if, uh, if this, well, I should also include this, right? These are the important terms. Uh, so when you have uh, this inequality, uh, then you see that uh, you end up with this inequality on sigma. Sigma is the, uh, the mu bubble of interest, right? So um, remember, this is the class. So what what that means is that suddenly you have a conformal metric on sigma, which is PSC. Uh, and so then the challenge is now, how do I set up something which obeys, I'll use a different color. How do I set up something which has this condition, which is, which is satisfied. Um, and that this, this little H is, is, is organized suitably that it picks out minimizes that you want. And by that, I mean, minimizes that, that, will allow you to kind of argue a contradiction in some way. Okay, so, so this is actually the main theorem we have. So from three to seven, right, in dimensions, complete manifold with non-negative scalar curvature and one asymptotically Schwarzschild and I'll describe what that means. It's a slight, um, slight, a slightly more uh, stringent assumption than asymptotically flat. Uh, but it's weaker than harmonically flat. Um, anyway, then the mass of that distinguished end is non-negative. Um, so, so what you see is uh, is this kind of theorem, right? This is this is this is the theorem essentially. But actually, it turns out that it follows from a more quantitative statement, which you could think of as maybe stronger than the previous slide. So, this is the the quantitative theorem so you've got u1 and u2 are neighborhoods of infinity so uh, if i'm if this is my asymptotically uh, flat end and these are the other ends elsewhere then uh, u1 is say uh, everything out here uh, right and then u2 say is everything out here Right, and what it's telling you is that if there are uh, no points of uh, incompleteness in the D neighborhood of U1, so that rules out, for instance, uh, if I had, uh, say, uh, if I had something that uh, might have these other ends, they could be doing whatever, I don't know what they're doing, but suppose that I had some, you know, had some point of incompleteness uh, here, say, Right, so this is this is now incomplete. Then what I need is I need this distance in the metric G from U1, right? So I need this distance here to be larger than D, right? So that's what the first assumption is saying. Um, the second assumption is saying that the scalar curvature is non-negative in the D neighborhood of U1. So I think that's one of the most surprising things. I mean, when you see the proof, it's end up being not surprising, but as a statement, it's something that wasn't anticipated, at least uh, when you look at the generalized positive mass theorem, or at least, you know, the conjecture of Shane Yao from 88. So in particular, 
what this is saying is that the scalar curvature only needs to be good, if you will, or non-negative in the D neighborhood if you want. So it, it's really localizing the non-negativity of the mass to the distinguished end. You know, in particular, the scalar curvature elsewhere, right? So the scalar curvature, say, on these ends, right? Here, the scalar curvature R could be could be going to negative infinity, right? And that's allowed. That's kind of amazing because in the PMT, right, you needed non-negative scalar curvature everywhere, and now suddenly you're allowing the scalar curvature to be arbitrarily large and you know in and have the wrong sign so long as it's far away from the um the region of interest uh but then you also need a kind of quantitative uh uh positivity you need it to be sufficiently large uh on a on an annulus so so in between u1 and u2 on this on this kind of little annulus you need it to be sufficiently large and if you do that then you you get what you want namely that the mass is non negative so I, I have another picture here, which is maybe uh, slightly neater than the picture I drew. So this is the largeness assumption, right? You have the largeness assumption on the on the annulus. Uh, you have no points of incompleteness in the D neighborhood. Uh, so that's what that's saying. Uh, and you see how um, how the uh, the bound on the scalar curvature that's required in, includes right the distance uh, in a quadratic way, which you could have expected from. Um, uh mu bubbles you see this kind of uh, quadratic decay um, all over the place uh, and you see the distance also that's uh, uh, that's happening or that, that you see between the um the thickness of the annulus as it were right so uh i'm gonna have to go a bit quickly now but um the the original argument uh was done for n equals three and it was generalized by uh rick shane uh for n from four to seven but the basic argument is that if you assume the mass is negative and you have this harmonic flatness, right, which is this extra decay condition, uh, then you can show that the coordinate planes uh, actually lead to uh, barriers, right? So you can find a minimal surface um, between two large uh, planes in living in the asymptotic region. So this is what this is saying, right? H is zero. This is a minimal surface. Um, along this along this tube, and here this is a coordinate plane. So x n say is equal to a zero, and x n here is equal to minus a zero. So that's that's what you mean by sigma little sigma a. A is kind of the height along um, here. That's what you call a. Uh, and little sigma is say the radius of uh, of this guy, right? So then what you do is you say, okay, well let me take a sequence of these. So you build a sequence uh, as little sigma uh, tends to infinity, and you show that this sequence, which I've drawn here, right? So this is as a little sigma as it goes to infinity. You show that it converges to uh, some uh, minimal hypersurface. And then because it's a minimizer at each step, you show that the stability inequality at each step leads to a stability inequality. So there's a stability inequality here. There's a stability inequality here. And you show that this leads to another stability inequality here, right? And you and you do this, and then what you show is that uh, this leads to a contradiction directly for n is equal to three. Um, but I'm not going to go into that argument. And then for four to seven, what you show is that the uh, stability inequality leads to the existence of a conformal factor. So the stability, well, I should say first of all, the mass of the uh of, of the minimal surface right but in one dimension lower so this minimal surface turns out to be asymptotically flat that's key uh, more than asymptotically flat it actually has zero mass and then you use the rigidity part um uh, excuse me sorry then you use the stability inequality that's inherited on the uh on this hypersurface to show that there exists a conformal factor which changes the mass uh, to something negative but of course that gives a counter example to the positive mass theorem in n minus one dimensions and so you're done uh but there are complications from the from the arbitrary n so in particular 
the compactification argument uh, of of low camp right uses um, this harmonic flatness, but this but the density theorem where you move to something harmonically flat, this is no longer available when you have these uh, arbitrary ends because you now have to solve a PDE on these arbitrary ends, which you don't know how to do if you don't assume anything on the arbitrary ends. Um, the original argument um that i showed you above uh it, it might not work because when you have these when you do this minimizer you know you've got some ends now and you don't know if your minimizer is being sucked into the into the ends um and there is a tantalizing fact which is that the, the in the if we if we look back to the slick uh proof with the geometric version of what we wanted namely no psc on torus connect sum uh, with something arbitrary is no, right? This was this this is the this is the work of Chodos Lee, right? So, uh, so you know this, you know this 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 works, but you don't you can't reduce it to prove the positive mass theorem. So, what we do is uh, we set up H is going to go to negative infinity, um, you know, say. Uh, within a D neighborhood of U1, where U1 was this was this region of infinity, and what that does, well, that will just you know cancel um, the the ends, right? All of these ends will no longer be relevant for the problem now, because uh, you know as H is going to negative infinity, and we look at at this functional, then um, you know your your minimizers are going to live north of this uh, red line. And if they live north of this red line, you don't need to worry about what's happening below the red line anymore. And then the main issue is, are you going to be able to uh, set up H and set up the stability inequality in a way that's strong enough to run, to run a kind of contradiction? So these are the mu bubbles we obtain, right? So H, H is going to negative in infinity here, say, and that will penalize any surface from ever venturing too close. And then um, C little sigma are the, is a coordinate, right? Is a cylinder associated with the, the coordinate planes I drew before, and the right and and this is a kind of curve in three dimensions at least. This is this is a curve that lives along the boundary. So remember what we had was something like this. We had the two coordinate planes, right? So this guy here is gamma little sigma and C sigma is the, is the, is the cylinder. And then the actual surface itself is little sigma, sigma A, where A is, is chosen. So the obtaining the, the mu bubbles using this kind of problem is doable. Uh, what you get is a uh, regularity and uh, you get a prescribed mean curvature. Uh, as as uh, you know, in the equations I showed you before, when when you have the mu bubble, you you know get the mean curvature equation, and then what you do is you build a sequence of these things. So this is my picture for the sequence. Um, you build a sequence for larger and larger um, little sigma, and what that does is each time you're penalizing anything from ever venturing too close to where you've cut off a, essentially the rest of the manifold. Um, and then you want little h to be going to zero uh, away, right? As you as you go large enough, because you want these guys eventually to to become minimal, if you will. And um, what what that leads to is a sequence of mu bubbles, right? That's that's um, that's simply what you get. But you get these mu bubbles with the boundary. And at this point, you might say, okay, well, you you it looks like it looks like you're you know, you've got, you've got something going, but what about the actual inequality? So the, the setting up of H has to work with the stability inequality that you get from the mu bubbles. But it turns out that all we need for this problem, but this is this we have to show, is that you, you only will only really need this. Um, and so that's where H is constructed. And that's where the um, largeness in R comes from. So, you know, when you, when I showed you that you had this, that you had this condition with the d on the denominator and this other d and the distance, so that that comes in by 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 the construction of of, of h. So this is this little little sigma. So there's a notation issue here. I shouldn't have used little little sigma because that was used above for the uh, radius of the of the of the coordinate cylinder. But um, 
But anyway, that's the that's how you construct H. And now just a word about um, asymptotic to Schwarzschild. So what that really means is that it's not harmonically flat, but it's but it's kind of like you can think a bit of as being uh, asymptotic to to the Schwarzschild metric, right? So I'm not going to write the Schwarzschild metric, but this is this is the conformal factor that you get in the Schwarzschild metric when you think of Schwarzschild as being conformally flat. So okay, so what what do you actually have to do? So you 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 have to build the sequence of mu bubbles, but you have to show that the mu bubbles eventually produce something nice. Uh, and so you have to control uh, sigma infinity, which is the limit of these of these mu bubbles. So, in the harmonically flat context, controlling this this sequence takes quite a bit of work, um, but it exploits the good asymptotics of G, namely the harmonic flatness. And this is what I was saying when this harmonic flatness lemma, the, or you know the right, the density theorem I mentioned initially, is very helpful in this context. But in in the in the arbitrary ends. You don't have this, so you 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 kind of have to uh, cheat a little bit, or you have to kind of think of it. You pretend it's harmonically flat, right? So you write it as something that's conformal to the Schwarzschild metric, where now psi is uh, the conformal factor to the to the Schwarzschild metric, and then you treat G as conformally flat to lower order terms, and you have to kind of control these lower order terms to show that in fact you do get something which is a graph. Uh, you know, eventually these mu bubbles, uh, you know, they converge to a graph um, sufficiently far out, uh, and 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 that takes that takes some work. And then finally, the stability you have to get, you have to kind of incorporate two two aspects. Of, so I know I'm running a little bit out of time, but I'll I promise to to be done uh, within the next three, four, maybe 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 four minutes. But um, the 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 key with stability, right, is that before you. So I told you that uh, to make mu bubbles work, you need to choose H so that you contain the relevant regions of interest, right? You 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 know you annul the uh, the effect of having an end or the effects of having a boundary, etc., and you're able to contain your problem. But that you you're going to lose something. You're going to lose something in the stability inequality. And the question is, did you set up H sufficiently well that you can still make your stability inequality work for you? Well, in this in this case, you need you need something extra. You don't just need that. You actually need to minimize with respect to a, which is where you you chose your your mu bubble along the coordinate cylinder, right? So remember, the picture was um, sorry if I'm making you seasick here. Um, the picture was 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 here, right? A is this, so a is along here, right? This is this is where a lives. So it's kind of the height. Uh, of where you're doing your mu bubble. So you minimize both the mu bubble functional, which gives you the stability inequality, but then that that's actually not enough. You also need to minimize uh, with respect to A. Uh, and what that does is that gives you, so the stability inequality ends up being kind of um, a bit of a mess because now the stability inequality involves a boundary variation um, as well as a bulk variation. Uh, and the bulk, uh, variation and boundary kind of look like this. So these are the terms that you get. Um, and then you have to show that this stability inequality is good enough uh, to get you uh, your contradiction. Now, what is what is going to be the form of your contradiction? Remember, in the ordinary or in the in the classic proof of the positive mass theorem, so not the slick proof, but the classic proof, you, in for, for n equals three, um, you showed that it was um, direct, right? There was a direct issue uh, with the stability inequality uh, in, in the spirit of a Gauss-Binet type um, argument. Whereas here, um, you do a kind of induction argument. So you show that there's a counterexample to the PMT in one dimension lower. Uh, and you do that by showing that the mass of, 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 of the relevant uh, hypersurface is zero, but there exists a conformal factor that uh, leads to something with negative mass and this conformal factor is controlled in various ways. So in order to do that, you need to solve a PDE um, and what you, you need to solve a PDE, but, the, but the, the only thing you have is the stability inequality and the decay on the, on the mu bubble. But fortunately, the stability inequality is strong enough uh, to get you, to get you your, um, the existence of a, of a conformal factor, which behaves in the right way. And it, it does take some work to show that this stability inequality uh, is good enough on the um, limiting mu bubbles. 
to get your conformal factor, which which produces um, something with negative mass in one dimension lower. So this was me trying to show you some of the terms that crop up. So you'll recognize some of these terms from the usual stability inequality. This is, these, these are some extra terms you get, some extra terms you get, and you, you, you really do, this is the, you know, decomposing the variation. So another thing I should say is that the variation isn't just normal. You need to vary kind of in different directions depending on, on where you are. Um, but I think these details, we can kind of just maybe go to just the last slide. So just the, the basic structure of the of the argument is that right so sigma infinity is is the limit of the mu bubbles is asymptotically flat moreover it has zero mass that takes some time to show because you you don't have these very nice asymptotics anymore you don't have harmonic flatness um but there's a there's a way around that and then you show this uh sigma infinity admits uh scalar flat metric with negative mass and that comes from the stability inequality which is what i just showed you before uh, and then you get this quantitative version of the theorem. Uh, and then by taking D sufficiently large in the quantitative theorem, you, you end up getting the, the positive mass theorem for just complete manifolds. Um, and in particular, what's interesting is that in the quantitative theorem, you know, because you don't care about what, every, what anything happens beyond the D neighborhood of U1, so U1, remember, was the region of infinity, and the D neighborhood was what happened within U, within the... Um, Right, because you don't care about what happens beyond that, then you know the scalar curvature could be doing absolutely whatever you want, and that doesn't matter at all to the to the argument. Okay, so I'm sorry I, I run out of a bit of time, uh, but thank you very much for your attention, and apologies again to the organizers for running uh, about five five six minutes over time. Thank you very much, Martin, for this uh, exciting talk. Uh, are there any questions? I don't know if that's a good sign or, or a <laughs> it's, uh, I, be I bet it is a very good sign anyway. <laughs> so, well, if, if, if there are no questions, we yeah, maybe I'm ah, there question. is one. So, yeah, uh, may can you go back to so your statement of your the main results? Yeah. Uh, this one, the quantitative theorem, uh, or the, or the, or the, or just this one. Uh, no, the the brewing any end. Yeah. So this is this is true for for this is the positive mass theorem for arbitrary ends, and this this is the quantitative theorem that produces the theorem of the previous slide. Okay, this is a possible. I, I want to ask uh, this is a possible to perturb a mu bubble or minimal surface to get a smooth uh, surface in higher dimension and to generalize re this result to any dimension. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, so you're, you're, yeah, so I should have, I mean, I should have mentioned that uh, the seven restriction is of course the standard re restrictions that you know is uh, due to the regularity um, issues that happen for eight and above so your uh, question is yeah maybe in the uh, show me also work use uh, some uh, modification on near the similarity to show the generalized test for the positive uh, positive mass theorem this is a possible to use this uh, show me also work to generate, give a generate your re your result to any dimension. Um, so first of all, I should say that the, that's an extremely interesting uh, question, and it, uh, it's very much a subject of investigation. However, um, unfortunately, I can't give you an answer. Um, it's <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to to I'm sorry to tell you. Um, the, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I don't know if mu bubbles um, can behave in the in the way that you might hope that minimal surfaces might behave uh, to make this proof work. Certainly, certainly, if you can, if you can, sh you know, if you can show 
uh, that mu bubbles, the 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 the, the if you can show that, say, the Shen Yao arguments or something. Uh, Actually, Shen Yao just use the conformal of conformal Laplace. He yeah, just studied the conformal Laplace and the curve of the minimal surface near the near the similarity because uh, he used the uh, uh, the conformal Laplace to deform the maybe the. Uh, Eigenfunction of the conformal Laplace to deform the, the similarity. I'm, I'm not sure. This is a yeah. Problem. I mean, yeah. I mean, there there is there are there are um ah uh, so there was a question in the chat. So I mean, just just to finish on that point, I I really don't know um how to uh how to handle higher dimensions. Uh, not only do I, I not know, I don't fully understand the minimal surface uh, arguments. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand uh, how you would try for mu bubbles, but I mean, it's a, it's a big avenue of research and, you know, any results of the kind mentioned, maybe, you know, perturbations using the conformal Laplacian or, you know, whatever would be amazing. I mean, that would be, that would be wonderful. Um, but I, 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 I can't give you any kind of uh, result or anything like that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. It's very, a very hard question. <laughs> uh, so there's a, there's a question in the chat. So can you explain a little more how you send the mass to the point P using the Green's function of the poor P? Yeah, so the Green's function, um, uh, the Green's function decays, uh, sorry, I mean, it decays. The 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 it it blows up like one over x, where x is the distance from the pole, right? So if the uh, let's go back to the Green's function. So the question in the chat. So right. So the Green's function looks like this on approach of say. Plus a constant plus something else. And um, with you know, this is you know ignoring normalization. Uh, so what what you see is when you use this as a as a conformal factor, uh, then this one over x term creates something that blows up, right? Because um, right, and that and that stretches the metric, uh, and so that produces something asymptotically flat. And then when you look at the, uh, the next order term, if you will, so you, you look at this new asymptotically flat metric, um, then the, the mass, right, if you have something that's uh, harmonically flat, say, so you say G is equal to U to the four times delta, then if U is, say, uh, one plus uh if it's one plus a over x etc then you you get that the mass uh is actually equal to a right uh so when you use the blow when you use when you use the greens function um so i might i might have got a formula let's see yeah, no, I, right. So when you when you use the Green's function, uh, so this is a different A. I should I should write it like say B or something. B, right? Uh, then then what you what you get is uh, when you evaluate the mass uh, of this new metric, right? Of this metric, uh, then you get something that's um, where the mass the mass shows up as being the the next term in the expansion of the Green's function. So not the one over X term, but the next term, the next term along. So B in this, in this expansion. Does that clarify? Okay, are there more questions? Okay. 
Okay, this is not the case. We thank you very much for this very nice talk and uh, also for waking up so, so early. Oh, that's right. So, <laughs> and and uh, hope to see you soon somewhere. Uh, okay, we, we resume at uh, well, 45 minutes for the next talk. Thank you very much, Martin. All right, well, thank you very much for the opportunity and the questions. Thank you. <laughs>